In February, the newly elected General Secretary, Jerry Pillay, as General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, WCC in Geneva, took place. The inauguration of the new General Secretary was also attended by the representative of the Holy See in Geneva, His Excellency Archbishop Fortunatus Nvachukwu. Today we are talking about ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, a very topical subject, especially against the background of the hot debates about the German synodal way and its tendencies, which Pope Francis commented last year with these words. In Germany there is a very good Protestant church, we do not need two of them. Nevertheless, and despite mostly theological differences, the Roman Catholic Church is very committed to interreligious dialogue with the Protestant Church and especially with the WCC, World Council of Churches in Geneva. Why is the Roman Catholic Church not a member of the WCC? What is ecumenism? What is interreligious dialogue? And then the question of how someone who does not believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, can come to the Father, to God. And Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through me. This and more now in a conversation with the Apostolic Nuncio in Geneva and Biblical scholar Archbishop Fortunatus Nvachukwu. The diversity of our convictions, now here on EWTN-TV UN Block. Greetings. At the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965, observers from the World Council of Churches, WCC, were admitted. Subsequently, there was a continuous process of rapprochement between the Roman Catholic Church and the ecumenical movement. In 1965, even for this purpose, a forum, a working group was established for joint study and dialogue between the WCC and the Roman Catholic Church. In 2018, many of us remember, the Pope traveled to Geneva to attend, among other things, the celebrations of the 17th anniversary of the World Council of Churches. The WCC recently elected a new General Secretary, Jerry Pillay, South African Protestant Reformed, theologian and university lecturer, who belongs to the Union Presbyterian Church in South Africa. His Excellency Archbishop Fortunatus Nvachukwu, permanent representative of the Holy See to the UN and other international organizations in Geneva, attended the investiture ceremony. I welcome you, Excellency. Good day, Christian, and thank you for having me. The World Council of Churches was founded in 1948 to work for ecumenism. The Catholic Church cooperates with the WCC but is not a member, although it sends delegates with observer status to its meetings. Why is the Catholic Church not a member of the WCC? Thank you, Christian. Um, it was a great pleasure for me to attend the installation of Dr. Professor Jerry Pillay, um, fine man of faith. It was moving to listen to um, testimonies about um, his personal life and um, his, as a man of faith, as a person of faith, and as a person that um, shares the word of God. The Catholic Church is not a member of the World Council of Churches, but we are um, uh, observers. I think I may give one or two reasons why we are not members. Um, from the po Catholic point of view, maybe I just, I, I could mention the ecclesiological fact that um, we have different uh, ways of looking at faith, especially uh, and also of uh, looking at sacraments and looking at um, um, uh, governing authority uh, with regard to the patron authority, the, uh, the person of the Pope. But of course, that would not be uh, enough reason for not being members. I think the bigger reasons might come from the side of uh, the World Council of Churches uh, from its nature. First and foremost, the composition 
of the World Council of Churches is according to local and regional um, churches. Uh, you can have um, various uh, national or regional, uh, let's say, Lutheran churches or uh, Anglican churches, uh, national churches becoming members. Incidentally, the Catholic Church does not work that way. The Catholic Church, when it participates or becomes member in such um, uh, a member of such a, a group, um, it goes in as the Roman Catholic Church and the churches that are in communion um, with Rome. And you know, we are talking about 1.2 billion people. If the Roman Catholic Church were to go in as the Roman Catholic Church and become part of the World Council of Churches, the population is going to practically inundate, overwhelm the other members. That is one um, element. Another element from their side is also from the point of view of the composition of the commissions, um, the committees and the commissions and the various composing bodies of the World Council of Churches. Membership in these bodies and um, um, uh, committees of the World Council of Churches uh, is determined by the population of the member churches. Give you the example, I give you the example of the current situation. In the current situation, the Orthodox churches alone co occupy 25% of membership in the various committees and um, uh, sub bodies of the World Council of Churches. We can imagine what would be the situation if the Catholic Church, with its 1.2 billion members, were to go in. How many Catholics would belong to each of these bodies? What percentage? You will find the membership of the Catholic Church crowding out, almost squeezing out um, the other members, and that is going to create an unfortunate situation, which would not be welcome to the Catholic Church and also to the other churches. So the Catholic Church has therefore focused on what we call joint commitment instead of on membership. And in this joint commitment, the Catholic Church is doing its best. We are doing our best to make sure that we participate, of course, without the right to vote in the various, various initiatives initiatives of dialogue, initiatives of promotion of common good, initiative of evangelization, initiative of international cooperation and collaboration, and all of them. We try to be very present at the World Council of Churches, not as members, but as observers and partners with joint commitment. Excellency, one must also distinguish between ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. Well, that's true. Um, interfaith dialogue is dialogue between people of faith, and that includes non-Christians. So we have interfaith dialogue even with um, our Muslim friends or uh, Buddhist friends or Hindu friends. So we have interfaith dialogue with uh, uh, people of faith of different religions. And we reach out to them when they have their major feasts. We send them messages, and they also send messages of um, fraternity to us during the major um, Christian celebrations. And we try to um, leverage on our common uh, values in order to work for common good, um, the good of all uh, the, this, our family the common family, which is this planet. Um, that is interfaith dialogue. But then ecumenism is the uh, working together and walking together of people of the Christian faith. It is usually between Christians, um, uh, between the Catholics and all the Christian families that are not of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. And that is um, the Protestants, uh, the various 
um, um, uh, expressions of Protestantism and the Reformed churches and also the Orthodox Church. That is the area of ecumenism. In your welcoming remarks, you said that we are all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, obviously addressed to the Christian participants present. Apart from some Protestant or Evangelical churches that have an interpretation that differs from the Catholic Church, for example, the Eucharist, but what about religions like Islam that do not accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God or as the Trinitarian God? From a strictly Catholic point of view, is it enough to be faithful to the Bible, to try to be brothers and sisters, to tolerate other religions and other faiths? Or is it only faith in Jesus Christ that can bring about true divine brotherhood, peace and harmony? Thank you, Christian. My immediate reaction will be to quote for you John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father uh, except through me. And then uh, the uh, immediate uh, question will be, what does Jesus mean? How can a person come to the Father through Jesus Christ? Now, do we um, have the full monopoly of how people can come to the Father through Jesus Christ? If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. So how wide is truth? Can somebody come to the Father following the truth without really um, being able, even if the person has not been able to come to the level of understanding that truth as an expression of Jesus Christ? Well, I would like to take you back to what Jesus himself did um, with his disciples. I'm going to take you back to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 38. Jesus was going with his disciples, and as he was uh, approaching Capernaum, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, on the way, we found someone who was casting out demons in your name, but he was not with us, so we tried to stop him. This is Mark chapter 9, verse 38. And Jesus, in verses 39 and 40, said to him, No. You should not stop him. Why do you try to stop him? And then he goes on. He who is not against us is with us. So we have to know that Jesus himself was also open to dialogue. Was open to dialogue. And um, he had his hands wider than what we can perceive as human beings. And as even as Christians, yeah, we try to define the basis, but the outreach is the outreach of the Holy Spirit. Now we also have to remember that Jesus himself said the other day, I think I was answering you when you asked about the extraterrestrial beings, and I took the uh, liberty to refer to the text where Jesus presents himself as a good shepherd in the gospel according to John chapter 9, precisely in verse 16. He said, I also have other flock, other sheep, which I also shepherd. Now, yes, we have to continue to insist and to say that Jesus is the sole way to the Father, but the interpretation and the outreach of that way, can we define it? The only thing, we define it, and we try to propose it. But then the ramification, especially in the area of truth, people who seek God in the truth of their lives, in some way also participate in that journey to God through Jesus Christ. And so, yes, when I said we are all brothers and sisters, on that occasion, I was referring on that occasion to all Christians. But from what I already mentioned to you, even going from the scriptures, we can also refer to non-Christians as our brothers 
and sisters if they are walking in the truth in search of God. Quoting again from your welcoming remarks, the world desperately needs the witness of authentic religious values to combat the selfishness, indifference and pride that too often characterize the activities of countries and international institutions. End quote. In your observation, are the United Nations in Geneva and other international organizations listening to religious values and not only listening but acting on them? Look, um, Chris, and I've already told you on another occasion that if people of religions were to really put into practice the authentic values taught by their religions, we would put the United Nations organization out of job. And I mean it. Maybe not specialized agencies uh, that have that, like the ITU that speak about intellectual uh, that speak about telecommunications or the UPU, which is also not really United Nations um, Universal Postal Union, but the areas that speak about disarmament, that speak about human rights and so on. If we were to live to practice the authentic values taught by our religions, we would so much live human fraternity that um, much of United Nations activities would be superfluous. I know that is a strong statement to make because we need the United Nations in order to provide, to have the platform that um, the, this organization offers humanity for us to sit together, to talk together, to dialogue, to negotiate in order to be able to live in harmony and in fraternity. Do they listen to uh, religious values? Of course they do. First and foremost, I want to mention that a large percentage, the majority of people representing the member countries of the United Nations, and even the people working in the organization itself, are people of faith. They may not be Christians, but they are believers, and believers that have got values in their religions. So there is a um, need. They really listen to the voice of faith that um, speaks of authentic values. Of course, there are moments when um, especially political interests and interests of the, or some personal interests um, come in conflict with um, the proposed religious values. That is normal and that is why we have to uh, dialogue and negotiate, but at the same time try to um, underline the importance of certain values. On our own part, these are values that are anchored on the uh, 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 primacy of human life, of human dignity and common good. Yes, they do listen to religious values or values that are proposed by people of faith. According to many surveys in Germany, the majority of people say that Islam does not belong to Germany. Now, does a religion, any religion, actually belong to any country, Excellency? Religion? I don't think any religion belongs to any particular country. Um, Christianity, of course, was not born in Germany, uh, just as Islam was not born in Germany. And even though Christianity, as it were, was born in the Holy Land area, it does not belong to the Holy Land area alone. Any believer of a religion can claim that that religion belongs to him or her. Um, so um, Christianity belongs to uh, Germans the way that the religion they believed in according to their, their belief before Christianity came, also belonged to them. Um, 
The same way, for example, I give an example in Africa. Neither Christianity nor Islam was born in Africa, but many Africans uh, either believe um, Christianity is their religion or Islam is their religion. The important thing we have to ask is not where a religion is born, but whether a religion makes us better human beings. That is, whether it improves our relationship with God and with our neighbors. The Germans have a right to say, these are our values, cultural values. If the religion comes and helps us to live according to this cultural value, then we accept it. If a religion comes and it is making us not to live as better persons, then we can say, no, we don't accept it. But we cannot say this religion belongs to us or that does not belong to us. And let me also say that it is difficult to find a religion which is intrinsically um, there to make people worse human beings. It is the way you receive a religion, the way you live out its teachings and its tenets that is going to help you to be a better person due to that religion or because of that religion. We can abuse or misuse any religion. We know we have the history in history. Of, we have history of people that have even abused Christianity, used Christianity as a means of oppression or support oppression. We have people that use Christianity to try to support slave and slave trade. We have people that try to use Christianity to support um, racial discrimination and apartheid. We have people that have used Christianity, tried to use Christianity to support um, even cases of fratricide. We can say the same thing also of Islam. People speak of terrorism, people that misuse Islam to support um, terrorist um, inclinations or terrorism. That does not mean we can identify a religion with the abuse of that religion. And we should not say that a religion belongs to us, one, and another one does not belong to us. No, I don't think. Germans can say Christianity belongs to them and um, Islam does not belong to them. They can say, well, Christianity is in line today with our culture. Islam is not in line today with our culture. But let us be careful. There are people also that are beginning to reinterpret Christianity. There are people also who are beginning to jettison parts of Christian, Christian doctrine and Christian values, trying to adopt it, trying to make it to their own taste. Does that make Christianity their own? No. The answer is no. No one can say a religion belongs to his or her country. We have some countries, for example, that say our country is the land of Islam. I ask myself, when did Islam come to the country? To whom did that country belong? More than before the year 622 AD, when the founder of Islam did his hijra. So we have to be careful before we say my land or this religion belongs to my country or that religion belongs to my country. In February, Pope Francis, Archbishop Justin Welby and Pastor Ian Greenshields embarked together on a historic ecumenical peace pilgrimage in South Sudan. During a joint ecumenical prayer service at the John Garang Mausoleum in Juba, the Pope said, 
Let us, dear brothers and sisters, work tirelessly for the peace that the Spirit of Jesus and the Father urges us to build. A peace that integrates diversity and promotes unity in diversity. The peace of the Holy Spirit harmonizes differences, while the anti-God and anti-human spirit uses diversity as a means to divide. Thank you for watching. God bless.